Friends, grace and peace to you this day from the one who is coming to bring healing and life to all the world, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. History is filled with figures that are, at least through the lens of history, often larger than life. But a close examination of history reveals that these larger-than-life figures were seldom alone in the endeavors that earned their place in history. Almost to a person, there were forerunners who led the way and prepared the way. Martin Luther is a perfect example. He's credited with the Protestant Reformation, and he certainly deserves much of that credit, but he was not the only reformer. And he was not even the earliest leader of the reforms he's most famous for. Jan Hus, a Czech theologian and philosopher, was a reformer who lived a century before Luther. Hus challenged the authority of the Pope, especially when it came to the use of military might. He was a forerunner, an influencer, and Hus's arguments can be heard in much of Luther's own positions. Ludwig von Beethoven didn't become the great composer that he is without forerunners. He was a student of Joseph Haydn, whom Beethoven met just after his 20th birthday. He later studied under Haydn, and you can read interesting stories about how those lessons went. Beethoven wanted from an early age to study under Mozart. Who wouldn't, right? Famous people often have powerful forerunners. Thomas Jefferson wouldn't be who he became without John Locke. Eric Clapton wouldn't be who he became without Robert Johnson. The world of scientific discovery is filled with historic advances, but often the famous scientists are not the ones responsible for most of the work that led to their discoveries. Forerunners made the advancement only to be outdone or overshadowed, often by a stronger ego. If you're interested in that kind of history, I recommend Bill Bryson's book, A Short History of Nearly Everything. Bryson recounts many little-known innovations that led to well-known advances. He names the unnamed forerunners of better-known scientists. John the Baptist is best known as a forerunner of Jesus. He's a strange one, of course, with strange dress and a very strange diet. We hear a bit about his appearance and his eating habits from Mark's Gospel lesson today. Those details are important because in that description, Mark connects John to one of the most powerful Old Testament prophets, Elijah. In Mark's telling, John has a place in the line of all the, old great, the great Old Testament prophets who are called to herald tidings of the Lord, tidings of comfort and also tidings of discomfort. In a few short verses, Mark connected John with Isaiah, with Elijah, and Mark placed him in the wilderness. That location connected him with Moses and the wilderness travels that preceded the entrance of God's people into the promised land. In the next year, many of our gospel readings will come from Mark's gospel. It's the shortest, but also the most direct of the four gospels in the New Testament. Mark doesn't trade in nuance, and preachers don't have to nuance his gospel as much as, say, John's gospel. The first verse of Mark's gospel is probably intended as a title of the book. When he wrote it, no one had ever written a gospel before. He probably didn't think that his designation of good news would come to describe and set apart four of the best loved books in history, an entire genre of sacred writings. Mark wanted to tell his readers including us, about the beginning of a new era, a time and a place 
in which God entered human history in an unprecedented way. That way was Jesus. But first, a preface. Yes, it begins with Jesus, but before Jesus, there was John. And before John, there were prophetic forerunners. In Mark's gospel, John the Baptist is basically an Old Testament figure. His clothing is based on descriptions of Elijah in 2 Kings. In some sense, Mark believes that John is Elijah, who has returned just as Malachi said he would. But most important, the, but the most important scripture for understanding John is Isaiah's first verses of chapter 40, our Old Testament reading for today. The passage announced God's intention to visit God's people. God gave directions for the way to be prepared, but by whom? By the people God wanted to visit? No, by God's own called servants. God didn't say, tell the people to get ready and when they have done so, I will come to them. God said, prepare the way. I am coming to my people, whether they are ready or not. One writer that I read this week put it this way. God is desperate, he said. God said, I will come to my people and nothing will keep me from them. Mountains will be torn down, valleys will be filled in, rough places made smooth, whatever it takes. The writer said it was hard not to think of that old Diana Ross song, ain't no mountain high enough to keep me away from my people. John prepared the way for God to once again come to God's people. And to get them ready, he offered a baptism of repentance at the Jordan River. In the Exodus story, God's people wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until at last they reached the Jordan River. When they entered those waters, they knew their wandering was over, and they knew that God's promises were about to be fulfilled. We hear this text at Advent to remind us that God does indeed keep God's promises. In this season of hope, we place our hopes in the arms of a faithful God. God comes to us in the form of the Son, Jesus, who saves. Jesus saves us from sin, death, and the powers of evil. Jesus overcomes all of that for God's people. John was the forerunner of the one who would save God's people. John's announcement was gracious, with only the dimmest echo of warning. Neither Isaiah or John nor Mark said anything to cause fear. They didn't say, God will come to those who are ready, those who are not will be left out. No. The point is simply that God's advent is certain and imminent. Perhaps such an announcement inevitably calls for a response. So John suggested two responses. Confess your sin and be baptized. Repent. Later, Jesus would add, repent and believe in the good news, the gospel. Hear this good news today. God will come and fulfill all God's promises, whether or not we do any of those things John suggested or Jesus suggested. But knowing God is on the way, why wouldn't we want to do them? Today, we're all waiting for a COVID vaccine to arrive. It's on the way. Pharmaceutical companies have made it, and it's effective in tests so far. Very effective, actually. The vaccines are promising and will save lives. It's important, though, to prepare for it. Preparations are underway to get the vaccine distributed. Preparations are underway to encourage people to actually receive it for their health and also the health of our community. 
those preparations will pay off, we hope, in the coming weeks and months. Until then, we know how to stay safe. We know how to be ready for the vaccine. We know what measures can make us safer. Masks, distance, avoiding crowds. These simple measures will keep us safer until we have the vaccine. Knowing the vaccine is on the way, why wouldn't we want to do them? Remember that the coming vaccine is for a new virus, but there's nothing new about the creation of a vaccine. There are many forerunner vaccines that have helped our health and the health of our neighbors for decades. All we've learned from previous viruses has helped light the way to this highly anticipated vaccine. Advent is when the church waits for God and anticipates the coming of Christ to comfort hurting people, to heal the sick, to forgive sinners, to save those living with the threat of death, to grant eternal life to all who believe. That is our hope this season. The hope of the prophets, the hope of the Baptist, and of the God who is coming to us.